in their understanding that what the Bible is saying, the holy book is saying, is that human beings are sinful and that that sinfulness involves more than simply a mistake. That there is something fundamentally wrong with humankind as the consequence of the choice that people made in rebellion against God that brought a serious consequence with it so that people are bent out of shape. The evidence? I think scripture and human experience. I mean, how many of you, if you would be honest, in the depths of your heart, in the quiet of your night when you're alone, can actually, actually deal with and overcome those tendencies within you toward self-centeredness, toward pride, toward lust, and on and on the list would go. And I think in a moment of honesty, most all of us would admit, no, we are not able through our own energies nor through ritual to overcome those things. Why? because of the doctrine set forth in the holy book regarding the nature of sin. Why the crucifixion? Well, let me put it in this kind of context. The crucifixion, in some ways, is a question of honor. A question of the honor of God. Now, the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament says that if a man sleeps with his mother, ah, uh, if a man sleeps with his mother, he brings dishonor on his father, and he should be put to death. If a man sleeps with his sister, he brings dishonor on his family, and he should be put to death. And on and on the provisions of the code of law go, raising the question of honor. You know about honor. You know about honor. Dishonor cuts one off. And so in the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, we are told that Eli's sons have brought dishonor on their father and they will be cut off. And within one chapter they are dead and gone. We read of Belshazzar a heathen king in the book of Daniel. And God says to him, because you have dishonored God, your days will be terminated. Your kingdom is over. You see, not only is it possible for us to dishonor our families, but it is possible for us to dishonor God. And so God in several places in the Old Testament says, you have dishonored me. You have brought shame on me. And in the New Testament, Jesus, quoting from the prophet Isaiah, speaking of the Jewish people of his day, says, These people honor me with their lips only, but their heart is far from me. You see, it is possible to honor God with one's lips and yet at the same time dishonor God. How does one deal with dishonor when it comes to pass? May I suggest to you it's not through ritual. You who are Muslims, think of your home countries. Think of the views that many people in your societies have. A daughter, a sister, slips out of the house unaccompanied and meets a young man on the street corner, and they talk, or walk, or hold hands, or touch, or have sex. A disgrace. And so the girl comes home having been discovered, and she says, Father, brother, family. I'm sorry. And they say, that's all right. 
forget it. You know better than that. You know that you do not remove dishonor brought on the family of a serious nature by someone merely saying, oh, I'm sorry, and someone else saying, forget it. What about the honor of God? When the honor of God has been offended, when you and I have brought shame on the very God who made us, what is to be done? Do you mean that we stand and say, God, I'm sorry? or that we perform some sort of external ritual, or that we even come with our heart and say, with all of my heart, I'm sorry, and I perform this ritual. No. God intervenes at that point, and here is the miracle of miracles. Jesus said in John 15, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. And I now call you my friends. And so God sends Jesus as the one who will step in between, who will deal with the issue of the dishonor that we have brought on God by making amends, by dying for us. As many a man or woman has died because they have dishonored their father or their brother or their sister. And the Quran talks about Abraham redeeming his son through a noble sacrifice. This is what God has done. He has redeemed us from the penalty due because we dishonor him by a noble sacrifice. That sacrifice being Jesus, the one who steps between, the one who becomes the protector the one who is the mediator or the intercessor, the one who takes the blow if there is a blow to be taken. And indeed, in issues of honor, there is always a blow to be taken. And so in John chapter 5, Jesus says, Moreover, the Father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I submit to you tonight that the crucifixion and the resurrection must be a reality. Otherwise, you and I are left with no hope, for we have offended the honor of God and it is not so lightly set aside. Well, is all of this reasonable? That one would die for others? Reasonable, yes. Above reason, also in some ways, yes. But it nonetheless is the act and the movement of God. A demonstration of God's love a demonstration of God's mercy, a demonstration of God's justice, a forgiveness grounded in the very nature of God, demonstrating the very nature of God. I would submit to you tonight that any sort of hope for eternal life based on each one of us being good enough or performing the ritual well enough is a very, very shaky kind of hope. God is set forth in the Bible and I think also set forth in Islam is a God of justice, a God who avenges, and also a God who is merciful and a God who is compassionate. Now I suggest to you that it's very difficult to somehow harmonize those ideas. How can you be just and avenging of your honor and of the insult done to you 